Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Happy belated Thanksgiving. I know we already did our Thanksgiving catch-ups with pretty much every one of you. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Acts chapter 11. It's funny, it's weird. We had turkey leftovers, and I'm like, you can't eat that before Bible study, because that'll just put you to sleep. I may put you to sleep, so the turkey's just going to help you. <laughs> no. No. So welcome, all of you, and a special welcome to anyone that's never been here, as we're accustomed to do. This is real simple, but it may be brand new to you. We just teach verse by verse through the scriptures. So we started the book of Acts. Gosh, I don't even remember when. But here we are. Um, I'll give you a little background from last week because this chapter is certainly directly tied to it. In your Bibles, you have chapter breaks and verse breaks, but in the original scrolls, they didn't have that. It just, you rolled it all out. It was all one book, so to speak. So uh, last week, we had talked about when... The church was moving into Gentile territory. So as you know, or may not know, Jesus was Jewish. He came first for the Jews. They rejected him. The church is born on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came. And certainly, and the Jews experienced what it felt like to receive the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. But now, it went after the Jews... The Jews rejected him. It doesn't mean a Jew can't get saved. Certainly, it still operates the same way today. He's looking to save everyone, Jewish people as well as non-Jewish people. Then it moved to people who were Samaritans. So to Samaritans were half Jewish, half Gentile. And we talked a little bit about them a couple weeks ago, how they came about. Now we come to the part Gentiles. It's probably mostly all of us in here tonight. Unless you have some Jewish blood running through you, we can thank God for his absolute mercy and grace that he came to us and that he wanted to save us. But it wasn't so easy because a Jew, you know, had this stigma. They had their, their animosity with Gentiles. They hated it. Kind of like, you know, if you grew up in the early part of this century where, you know, racism was terrible and people hated ones of different colors. Different, the, the Jews didn't like the Gentiles whatsoever. But God had to show the first church, the Jewish leaders, like guys like Peter, that hey, Jesus Christ is for everyone and he loves everyone all the same. The Bible tells us he's no respecter of persons. So regardless of your past, regardless of your race, nationality, background, regardless of how good or not good you think you've been, he doesn't love me any more than he does you, simply because I'm up here teaching the word. Please understand that. Please know that he loves us all the same. He's no respecter of persons. And so when... Peter experienced this outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. This was all brand new. And now when we get ready to begin in Acts 11, that's kind of where we're picking up because now Peter first is going to defend himself because word is going to get back to the first original church, the Jewish <laughs> believers, because they have a hard time believing that God wants to save Gentiles, that God loves the Gentiles, that God really wants to do this. So let's pray before we begin and ask the Lord to bless this time. Heavenly Father, we just so thank you for your word. Lord, as the psalmist declared that you esteem the word of God above your name, which is a remarkable thing because you tell us that there's no name, there's only one name under heaven which men and women can be saved by, and that's the name of Jesus. But yet you hold your word even higher than that. It's a holy, sacred thing, and sometimes we take for granted this book. It's not just words on a page. These are words of eternal life. And they're meant to correct us. They're meant to instruct us. And they're meant to change our lives. So I pray tonight that when we leave, we certainly will experience all three. 
And we will be just like you, Lord Jesus. That's our goal in this life is to be like you. Help us, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So again, in Acts 11, chapter 1, follow along with me. You may have a different translation, but I'm going to backtrack. I'm going to read a couple verses, and then I'm going to explain it, and we'll pick it apart. So in chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision, those are your Jewish Christians, they contended with him saying, you went into the uncircumcised men and you ate with them? So just as I was alluding to at first, and it's so true, isn't it? Bad news always spreads so fast, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I used to work in a restaurant. You could, do a, you could have a hundred good customers. You could just, I mean, shine like the stars, but the day that you mess up one time, <laughs> Everybody knows about it. They don't hear about any of the good you've done. You, you could be a saint in there, but you mess up, and the bad news, everyone already knows. Why? Well, I don't know why that is, but it's just true. So the word got back to these people. You went into the Gentiles, and you ate with them? Again, keep in mind the context, the Jewish mindset. They could, they, the Gentiles in the Jewish mind. They were considered as low as dogs. And God is busy at work in the new church, eradicating all our prejudicial walls. Because guess what? They're still in the church today, are they not? Last week, and I made this illusion, I made this illustration and point that, hey, they, every church serves its purpose. But God did such a work in these men and with these women's hearts. So that there would be unity. But yet today we have churches that are all of one race. All of one people. And again, I kind of know why that happens and it goes there. But it's really not supposed to be. We should all be one. Now, if you like that pastor better than this pastor, okay. So you, you get better fed there. Go there. But don't let it be a black thing. Don't let it be a white thing. Don't let it be a Chinese thing. That's not why you choose your church. Does that make sense, guys? It's about the word, it's not about our culture. Because guess what? The gospel, this word, overrides all of our cultural tendencies. And it should. But sadly, in some churches, it doesn't. The culture's first. And then the word of God is second. But that ought not to be. So they, they, here's Peter. He's put on the spot by his Jewish, his Jewish friends. So he's going to explain... Chapter 10, his vision. Ready? Verse 4. But Peter explained it to them in the order from the beginning, saying, Look, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descended like a great sheet that let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean at any time has entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed you, you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered this man's house. And as he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you the words by which you and all your household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning... And then I remembered the word of the Lord and how he said, John indeed baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? And when they heard these things, they became silent. They glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles the repentance of eternal life. 
So Peter's going to retell his account to defend himself. And it starts with this vision. That's what chapter 10 is. So on your own, if you didn't read it yet, you go back and you can read how Peter experienced this vision. Now, vision is very important. Why do I say that? Because in the book of Proverbs, you don't have to turn there. If you're a note taker and you just want to jot the verse down, listen very carefully. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But happy is he or she who keeps the law, the word of God. Why am I bringing this proverb to your attention? Where there is no vision, People perish, and it's directly correlated and tied to the Word of God. So, number one, I want to say this. Your pastor, whoever or that person may be, needs to have a vision. Where is this ministry going? What is its intent? And it should be directly tied and based in the Word of God. It's got to be. Why? Because today, pastor's visions are to have the biggest and baddest church in the world. They want the most amount of people so they can say, hey, look at me, y'all. I'm the man up in this piece. I'm the best guy. Come hear my speech. Come hear my sermons, right? Many pastors, sadly, and people of different denominations, their vision is to get rich. And this may hurt. This may sting. But guess what? When you go to a church and they pass that bucket around three times, I can tell you what their vision is. They want your money. Sadly, that's not based off the word of God. <clears throat> when Jesus tells Peter to go start his church, when he restores him, he says, go feed my sheep and go feed my lambs. A.K.A. just teach them the word of God and let God Minister to their needs, raise them and train them up in the faith so that they grow big and they grow strong in the Lord. Some of you may be saying, I've never been to a church that's ever done that. Well, guess what? That's my vision. That's what I'm here to help you do. Because someday, you who are sitting there, you may be up here. Someday, someday soon, you may start your own small group, your own Bible study at your home, your own men's or women's devotional. Guess what? You're going to do the same thing because God's going to give you a vision. Mark my words. You need to have that vision. And Peter got the vision. And Peter struggled with the vision. Why? And we talked about it because he was resistant to change. How many of you love change? <laughs> All hands are tied under their seats because they don't want to change. And, and he, had to, he had to tell Peter three times, hey, wait, I'm God telling you what to do, right? But look what he says in verse 8. Take a note. Look what Peter said. I said, not so, Lord, and we mentioned this last week. You can say no to Jesus. You can say Lord to Jesus, but you can never say no, Lord. Um, yeah, Jesus, I know you died on the cross for me, and I know you saved me, and you gave me eternal life, but I'm still not going to do what you want me to do. I'm not going to change. Well, you can say that, technically. But if you really love the Lord, if you look at the cross and recognize what he has done for you, you know, it's easy. Honestly, I think it's easy if someone were to put a gun to my head and say, Jim, do you really love the Lord? Because if you say yes, I'll pull the trigger. I'd be like, pull it. I know where I'm going. It's easy for me to lay down my life and die for Jesus. But you know what's not easy? It's not easy to live for him. Let's just be real, can we? You really want to be an outspoken Christian this day and age? Let me tell you comes at a cost, and it's not easy. So I can understand Peter saying, no, Lord, I don't know if I want to change. You're telling me his vision. You're going to go to the Gentiles, the people that the Jews have despised,
for generation after generation after generation. And God saying, the buck is going to stop with you, Pete, because they need to know that I love them. And I paid for their sins too. And they are welcome in my house, as are all of we. Number two, I want to say this. In the vision, Peter sees all these unclean things that were foreign to him. Remember, as a kosher Jew, there were certain things in the law. It's some, you know, not the most exciting reading in Leviticus, okay? I understand it because it's all about their dietary law, things that make them clean and unclean and all that stuff. But let me ask you, don't some days you feel, Lord, I'm just a mess up. I'm that dirty, filthy foul. I'm that unclean beast. I'm a wretch. I got a foul mouth. I got a sour spirit. I got hate in my heart. I got all this. How could you still love me? You guys ever get there? Do you ever feel that way some days? I know I do. But let me give you a verse. And I want you to turn there so you can see it for your eyes. Go to the book of Isaiah. It's the Old Testament. And you don't have to turn there, but you can mark it as a reference. But I want you to see this. Because you know one of the things, it's Isaiah chapter 61 starting in verse 10. And one of the things that truly helped me in my walk with Christ is this. The enemy comes at us 24-7 to make us feel like... God doesn't love us, that I did enough today to make God stop loving me, to stop wanting to fulfill the vision and the plan that he has for your life. Let me tell you, that's nothing but the enemy. Would you look with me in Isaiah chapter 61, or just listen out, and I'll help you find it afterwards. In Isaiah 61, starting in verse 10, listen, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Why? For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, as a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown into it to spring forth, take note, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. There, we have a lot to rejoice in. We have a lot to be joyful in. So when you're feeling like that filthy fowl, that dirty creature, please know God is not done with you. Oh, that's when you come to him and you say, oh, Lord, like Paul says, what wretched, sinful man that I am. And guess what? He meets us there. He knows our failings. He knows our frailty. But his grace and his love, it never ends. You can never, you can never push God out of your life. You can never do enough harm that God would say, oh man, well, you know, you started out okay, but I changed my mind. Get out of here. Never, never happens. Because the Bible says God is love. He's not a God just of love. He is love by definition, meaning that's all he knows how to do. And I love that because some days I'm like, Lord, why should I even come to Bible study tonight and teach? I, it was such a, just a hard week. If people saw my heart and my inward thoughts, they would be like, they'd definitely not come and listen. But we can get there. So take note, and this ties down to verse 9, because what God has cleansed, back in Acts chapter 11, what God has cleansed, and listen, he's cleansed you. If you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, he's cleansed you, past, present, future, of all unrighteousness, all your sin, all your bad habits, all the bad that we could possibly conjure up in this life, you have been cleansed. Do you understand that? Because I hope you do. Because with that realization that, wow, he knows when I'm going to fall and make a mistake, but he picks me up like a dad who watches his kid fall, they cry and they're all battered or skid marks. 
What do you do? Do you laugh at them? Well, it's your fault you fell. You didn't see the rock. I taught you how to walk. You don't know how to pick one foot up in front of the other. You don't say anything like that to your kids, do you? You get it back up. You wipe the tears away. And you say, okay, son, okay, daughter. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. That's our God. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves me. Don't call something that I've cleansed. Don't call it common. Don't call it unclean. Down in verse 15, as, again, he's just retelling the vision, so I don't want to recant last week's message. But take a look at verse 15. Because as Peter's explaining himself, he's like, look, I was just doing what God told me to do. These people showed up at my house. I began to share the good news with them. Verse 15, and as I began to speak, Peter was giving him, he was giving Cornelius and his house, these Gentile people, he was giving them the gospel. And it says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as it was in the beginning. So if you go all the way back to Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit first fell, Peter witnessed the same thing now happen with the Gentiles. And that's all he needed to see. That's all he needed to hear. Because now at this point, the church must go forth and welcome everybody in. And then it says, take note in 16, then I remembered the word of the Lord. I like that because it always comes back to the Word of God, does it not? It's not about experience, though every one of us has some really powerful experiences with the Holy Spirit, and they're all good. You know, if you've been to churches where wild things happen according to the Holy Spirit, I want to tell you that that's not the Holy Spirit. That's just people who are usually really good actors. Not to say you can't have an encounter with God that will put you on your knees. I'm not saying that. But when people say, you've got to come stand here and receive the Spirit, um, no, I don't. I can stay right where I'm at. And he'll meet me right here. And if he wants me to fall to my knees, I'll fall to my knees. But he remembered the word of the Lord. And he remembered back, all the way back to when Jesus had talked to him about how this was all going to take place. John indeed baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized when I send you the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus in John 14. He promised to send another helper. So if you put it as a side note, you want to go read it, John chapter 14. The Holy Spirit was going to come. And it was going to then do all this incredible stuff. Then we get down to verse 19. And it says, now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen. And that's back in like Acts chapter 6 or 7-ish. That because of the persecution that arose, everyone was scattered. So they went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them who were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So you want to take note from verse 20. You have these random believers, because it just says some of them, so they're not the apostles. It wasn't the Peters and the Johns going, just these random people that got saved. They were so on fire from the, with the Lord. They had such a burning love for Christ that they were just sharing with anyone that they could. And that's an encouragement to me because I'm a nobody. But if you know me well, what do I always try to keep on my lips? The gospel. That's an encouragement for all of us. Yeah, guess what? In our eyes, we may be just your average worker at your 9 to 5 job. You know, we're not going to be on the cover of People magazine and, you know, the world's most beautiful people. But guess what? When you preach the gospel, lives are changed. When you share Christ, lives are changed. Because everyone will come at some point. You're going to meet people who are hurt and broken, and they're looking for answers, and you are going to provide that to them. When you say Jesus is the answer, he's got what you need, and he's the only place you're going to find it. You're not going to find it in counseling. You're not going to find it in Buddha, in Hare Krishna, in Muhammad. It's only going to be in this God of love. His name is Jesus. And take note where they went. 
verse 20, they went to a place called Antioch. Antioch. Now, why is that important? Because most of you may be saying, I have no idea where Antioch is. I don't know a lick about it. I'm glad you were thinking that, because I'm going to help you with that. Antioch was, at this time, the third largest city in the known world. 300 miles north of Jerusalem. You know, you had uh, Rome and Alexandria, which were larger. But then you had this incredible place called Antioch. Five different cultures of Greeks, Romans, Persians, Jews, Semitics, all the Arabs. You had all of these cultural blend here. It was an interesting place because it was known for its lasciviousness, its wildness. Uh, you had in this city people there because it was a big place for chariot racing, which was big back in their day. But it was also especially known because, of course, with all these cultures, you had all these Greek and different gods and goddesses. Well, it was especially known for the, uh, for the worship of Daphne, which meant that there was this big temple and all these women that worked the temple, they called them priests and you know, or priestesses, but basically they were prostitutes. So, young and old men, when they were feeling a certain way, they just went to the temple and they had their way. Kind of like Las Vegas, Sin City, or maybe like a New York City, you know, the city that doesn't sleep. There was always some kind of trouble you could find yourself into, some kind of party to go to, some kind of whatever. Why am I bringing this to the forefront? Because as we continue, isn't it interesting to know that in this dark and decrepit and debauch, like this, the debauchery that took place, it's here, as we're going to get to, it's the first place people are known as Christians. And it's such a rebuke to me because Sometimes I look at certain people and I'm like, they will never receive the gospel. They'll never be a Christian. Look at their life, Lord. And that God has to say, but Jim, where were you when I saved you? And for those of you who don't know, I was pursuing acting. I was on my way to Hollywood's finest. I was having success. I was, and <laughs> there was parties galore. Money, women, booze. That's when I got saved. You see, no matter how dark it gets out there, those of you who've ever seen Batman the Dark Knight with Heath Ledger when he plays the Joker, there's an incredible line that is spoken in that movie. And he says, you know, the night is always darkest before the dawn. And dawn is coming. The sun is going to rise. As Christians... Do we not shine, shine brighter and better when it's, you're just around dark, darkness, right? <laughs> so when you're singing praises and the people all around you just want to cuss and talk about filth, they're going to hear the words that come out of your mouth and be like, how come they don't cuss like us? How come they don't tell dirty jokes like us? When your light is shining, and I love it because this is the, probably the best time of year. No illustration is needed. You drive in the dark, you turn the block, and you see a house that's all lit up, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, isn't that beautiful? You just stare. When I lived in Cherry Hill, the two houses on the corner, they had a light match. It was the Griswolds versus the Griswolds too, And they just mm -hmm. would try to outdo each other. And you could see the light literally from blocks away. <laughs> I, I felt bad for their electricity and how much they must have paid for their bills. I mean, if here we freeze in the winter because I'm like, I'm keep the heat down. It's costing too much to heat this place, right? These people are cranking their lights out. I'm like, man, well, just tap into my bill, will you? You know? But the point is this. You see that light far away, do you not? Like a lighthouse, isn't that why they're built? So when ships are navigating in the complete darkness, what is it that stops them from crashing on the shore? Or oftentimes it's that lighthouse that they can see far away. You and I are that, we are, Jesus said, right? The salt and the light. So, out of this dark city, a 
Christians come. People start getting saved. So don't give up on anyone simply because of where they're at in their life. It says, take note in verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them. A great number believed they turned to the Lord. Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came, take note, he had seen the grace of the Lord. He had seen the grace of God and he was glad and he encouraged them all with the purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. So, again, two quick things just to point out. Barnabas comes, the son of encouragement. He's the one that originally, when Saul of Tarsus got saved, so this is your Acts chapter 9, the guy that was killing Christians and sending men, women, and children to their death to prison because they were believers in Christ. He was a Pharisee. He was a zealous Jew. He wanted the Christian religion dead. So he did his best, to, and he killed people for it. This man, when he gets saved, meets Barnabas. And eventually Barnabas is the one that led, that took him and encouraged the other believers, the other apostles to accept him into their family of God, if you remember that. He plays an important role. We'll touch on him in a minute. But what is it he takes note of? It says he saw the grace of God. You know, is that you? When people get around you, when people describe you and talk about you, like, like people say, Jim, how come you're always smiling? <laughs> like I think they, t they think I take drugs. <laughs> you're, it's Monday morning. I walk into work. Bless the Lord, all oh my soul. Like, dude, it's Monday morning. What's wrong with you? I'm like, no, it's what's right. It's the only thing that's right. I got Jesus in my heart. I'm going to heaven. I sing this every day. Do people see that grace in your life? Are you known as, you know, the smiley one? Or, as I love to illustrate it, are you the Eeyore? You guys remember Winnie the Pooh? Okay. Let's go to church. Let's read our Bibles. Not knocking if you're having a bad day, because we all have them. It's called warfare. How many times Daryl gets my text? Help! Exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. That means get on your knees and pray, because I'm under attack. <laughs> but the thing is, he saw these believers there, and they didn't even have a pastor. How are they getting fed the word of God? I don't even know. But you know, when you first experience salvation, I know for me, that's the way it was. It was just, wow, the scales, I can see again. I'm alive. Jesus is real, and he's, oh my gosh, and he loves me. There was so much, like, just, I couldn't stop talking about Jesus. I miss those days. It was so innocent. Because I didn't, you know, that was before all these people asked me 500 questions about, you know, the Bible's been, been transliterated wrong, and, you know, why is there so much this, and, that, and it's just like, now I'm stuck, at, not stuck, because I enjoy answering these questions. But you know what I'm saying, when you're first saved, man, God does a radical makeover in your life, and there's that evidence, that grace. But as you mature, and as you walk this faith out, guess what? Sometimes the joy, it's like a slow leak in your tire. You don't know you're running out of love and running out of that joy until the light goes on, right? And you're like, oh, I need air in the tire. And I've mentioned this to the guys and the women will be doing it too. We're going to start a men's group and a women's small group in the beginning of the year because guess what? As guys, we need to come together because I know some of your stories and we're in tough places. <laughs> we need to pray and encourage one another. To finish this race well. Same thing for the ladies. So be prepared for that. But he saw, and take note, back in verse 23, not only when he came and he'd seen the grace of God was he glad, but what does Barnabas do? Well, he encouraged them all, and with that purpose of heart, that they should continue with the Lord. How is that? They're going to continue by studying their Bibles. That's why we do this here. We teach line upon line. Precept upon precept, we are going to go through the whole Bible because for some of you and some people listening, maybe your first time going through verse by verse, and you're like, this is really different. I'm used to falling asleep in church because I, the guy lost me three minutes into his message. 
But the stuff is starting to make sense, but I don't know who all these characters are, these places. Guess what? That's why we study verse by verse. Because once you start piecing these things together, and you get a little wisdom from the Lord under your belt, let me tell you, it's like you got when you're hungry, right? When you're hungry, you can walk, you can smell food 10 miles away, can you not? <laughs> What's that? It's, I feel like I'm like my dog, my ears perk up, I smell snake. There's a burger joint that's uh, 10 miles away, but I can still smell it. <laughs> but if I'm not hungry, it, it may still smell good, but it's not as potent. If you're hungry for the Lord, if you really want to know him, you're going to get to know him by this and this alone. I'm just an addendum to help you understand this. But let me tell you, you really don't need me. Just read your Bibles. Study. In, the, in John, it says, man doesn't need a teacher. It doesn't mean you don't need a pastor, because we all do. But when you get alone with the Bible, read it. And let him minister to your hearts. I'm telling you, you'll be blown away when you do that on a regular basis. And that's exactly what Barnabas was there to do. Encourage them to continue to study Verse by verse, study the word of God. Verse 24, for he was a good man, speaking of Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to get whom? Saul. Why does he go and get Saul? Because at this point, you have to know, it's approximately 10 years later since Saul got saved. It's 10 years since Acts chapter 9, Saul goes away, and now Barnabas seeks out to find him. So Paul has had 10 years to spend with Jesus, 10 years to grow in the faith. You know, I tell people this, if you're a doubter, if you're questioning all this and that, does Jesus, I said, do me a favor. You come, not just to this study, because you may not like this study. You may decide, I'm done with this study. I'm done with you, Jim. I never want to hear it from you ever again. Okay, fine. But don't give up on Jesus because I failed. Find another Bible study. Give Jesus three months of consistent Bible reading, consistent prayer, and seeking. And mark my words, I guarantee, I guarantee he shows up and you find him. For me, that's how I came to Christ. I grew up in a church. It did nothing for me. The guy didn't really teach. He didn't believe in what he was teaching. So I left. But when I left, eventually the world, I got enough of it. And again, God was seeking me out. And I made a deal with God. I said, God, if you can change my life in one year, everybody deserves a chance. I'll stick with you. Well, here we are 17 years later. That's why I can make the 100% guarantee. If you seek the Lord, like the Bible says, he will be found. But some of you just need to give it some consistency. Give them a chance to change your life. Don't throw in the Jesus towel simply because maybe a past priest has failed you, a past pastor has failed you, a past church has burnt you. Some people go through those experiences and then they come to this conclusion, Jesus is a failure. That is not the case. As men, as women, we sin. Sadly, we do. But we're all together. Listen, that's the one thing that bonds us. We're the greatest dysfunctional family ever put together. <laughs> But the one thing that, come, that unites us, that brings us all together, that makes us all whole, is Jesus and nobody else. Amen. I can't make us all whole, but this book can. So please, don't give up on Jesus. If you're thinking about it, don't, please. So, he departs to go find Saul of Tarsus. And when he found him, brought him to Antioch. Again, he brought him because revival's taking place. Oh, I so hope to see this. I would love to see this building. Literally, we can't fit any more people in it. And guess what I'm going to call upon you and you? I'm going to need some help. I can't teach all these and help all these people. But guess what? That's why God brought you here. So this is a season while you're growing under the word to be prepared because you're going to get the phone call. The bat signal's going up. Yo, Sam, yo, John, yo, Bill, yo, I need your help. Going to need it. Be ready. And when he found them, he brought them to Antioch so that it was a whole year that they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. 
And here we go. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, the word Christians in the Greek, okay, is where you get the word Messiah, anointed one for. So basically, <laughs> these, these people, it's not always a good way because this is a Gentile word that they're using because the Jewish people would never associate Christians as being little Christ. But in a sense, that's what we are. We are little Christians, little Christ. We're not the Messiah by any means, no. But we represent him. It says they were first called this because up till now, Christians were known as believers, disciples, uh, saints, the brethren. They went by different names. But here in Antioch, interesting, they're first called Christians. Now here's the one thing I want to kind of hammer home about this. <laughs> When you hear the word Christian, when someone says, I'm a Christian, what does that mean nowadays? The word is so ambiguous. It's got, it's been so, there's so many ways to define Christians. I mean, so let me just share some of my experiences and maybe it'll help you understand this. Like I've met some who think because they're born in America that they're a Christian. Um, I can tell you that's not the case. <clears throat> During the British colonial era, the word Christian became synonymous for the word Englishman. Just as a free fun fact. Regardless of how godly or perverted you were. You see, someone who says, I'm a Christian today, may in fact very well not be one. People think that they're a Christian because they go to church. That's probably the most common answer I get. Hey, when I say, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Well, what makes you a Christian? Well, I go to church every Sunday. Eh. Wrong. Try again. You remember Family Feud? I just see the big X over the bed. What makes you a Christian? I'm a good person. I do good works. God's happy with me. That makes me a Christian. It's got to be. Eh. <laughs> Strike two. What makes you a Christian? I got to turn there. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. So after Acts, turn to the right, to the very next book. I'm turning it with you so I can read it correctly. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Here we go. That if you confess with your mouth that Lord Jesus, I guess I should back up a little bit. Let me start in verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near to you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith by which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what makes us Christians and absolutely nothing else. It is not by works you're a Christian. It's not by your church you're a Christian. It's by your faith that when you die, because you've accepted Jesus and his atoning work on the cross, when he bled out, he was beaten, beer ripped from his neck, beaten beyond human recognition. When you accept that he did that for your sins, that's all you have to believe. But you got to mean it. you got to mean it. When you accept that and you truly believe that, you are safe. They ask Jesus, hey, what do I have to do to believe in the works of God? He says, just believe in the one in whom he said, speaking of Jesus. That's the true work of God. You see, you're not saved by your works, okay, ever. How could any of us add to this? Think about it. How could you possibly add to God who became man just to receive a beating and a punishment he did not deserve? And he laid it down because he loved us. Because he wants you and me in heaven with him when we die. Every other religion in the world is works-based. Hear me clearly. 
every single one. you got to do something, and you still do not have the assurance of heaven. Only Jesus says, just please accept my gift. It's Christmas time. This is the best time to witness. Why? Because everybody's busy giving and buying gifts. And I've been there when you get those gifts that you really don't want. Grandma, aunt, you open it up and you're like, you're ready to vomit. But you have to put on the poker face. This is the most beautiful thing I ever thank you so much, Grandma. Come here, big. And meanwhile, here, here, doggy. You handed it off, like, get rid of this, right? <laughs> Salvation is a free gift. The Son came to give us life. And you know what's amazing? People will still say to me, Jim, but I don't want it. That breaks my heart. How could you not want what he has to give you? He wants to restore you. He wants to buy you back, hence the name of our ministry. So for those who've ever asked, why do you call it redeemed and restored? Because redeem is a term meaning he's buying you back. He sees that you owe a debt. I owe a debt that can't be paid. Bill Gates can't buy it. Michael Jordan can't buy it. The combined wealth of the earth can't buy it. It's imaginable, unimaginable. He bought you, took you out of your sin. And put you in a righteous place. Remember Isaiah 61. And he clothed you with his garments of righteousness. All because you just trust him for what he's done. And then he says, I love you. Now just follow me. That's all I want you to do. I know this road is going to be tough. You're going to have your trials. But I'm with you. This Christmas season... Don't let anyone ever call it a holiday. You tell them it's a holy day. And you say, and on this holy day, let me give you a gift. Let me share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. And see if they'll unwrap that package and accept them into their lives, right? That's what I want to see this Christmas. I want to see this come from school. Everyone get saved. I want to see my neighbors get saved. I want to see everybody saved. Why? We're only here. The clock is ticking. We don't know how long we're going to have, right? And it's the only gift that brings a true return. <laughs> you give that gift of Jesus Christ to someone, I guarantee. I guarantee. When you see their life begin to change, you're going to be like, let me share it with somebody else. Maybe Jesus will change their life, too, and he will. But coming back to this name of a Christian, I heard it best said, <laughs> if you were arrested, I have a friend here who's a police officer, <laughs> so he, he's aware of people when he arrests. If you were arrested for being a Christian today, would there be enough evidence to convict you? So... You stand before the Lord. Okay. I gave you how many years to repent? And then how many years to love and serve me? What are we doing for him? Do people even know you believe in Jesus Christ? Why I'm so passionate about this is this. I grew up three blocks from here. Right across almost the street from my man Daryl. And I grew up and not one person ever shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with me. Not one. So everyone who said they were a believer were content to let me go to hell. Or let somebody else preach the good news to Jim because I'm not going to do it. It sounds a little sting, a little harsh. And, but you know what? Because the church is asleep, men and women. We will not sleep. I won't let you sleep. <laughs> Mark my words. We're in the book of Acts. What is the reoccurring theme? People get saved because people share. People share, why? Because they experience the risen Savior. They experience love, forgiveness, healing, being made new. Why wouldn't you want to share that? I don't know. But it's going to take 
somebody to put a bullet in my head to get me to stop sharing. I tell, I do prison ministry, and I tell the guys, prepare a seat next week, because you know what? At the rate our country's going, I might be arrested for what I preached, which is the truth. It's the word of God, and so be it if I am. And then guess what? I'm going to minister to all the inmates, and we'll see the whole prison get saved. But while it costs you nothing but maybe a little extra time. And you know, God will often have you witness to someone at the most inconvenient time. You'll be running out the door, and like I was at Wawa, I'm late for work, and somebody says, oh, I like your shirt, because I wear Christian shirts all the time. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm really late. Do I share Jesus, or do I just show up a little late? I think the person's going to understand when I tell them, well, I'm a little late because I got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone. So I encourage you, is there enough evidence to convict you? Let me read you this last thing in closing. You guys remember or ever heard of Alexander the Great? He was just 23 when he conquered the known world as he knew it, if you don't know that. Alexander the Great once learned that in his army was a namesake. There was another Alexander who was no a notorious coward. Alexander the Great, who conquered the world when he was just 23, he called the soldier before him and he said this, Is your name Alexander and are you named for me? The trembling coward said, Yes, sir, my name is Alexander and I was named for you. The great general said that either be brave change your name. <laughs> now, let me make a quick note. God doesn't say that to us because sometimes we cower and we're a little fearful. He doesn't say, well, change your name, but you get the point. If you say you believe in Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, you, <laughs> does it line up? Is there evidence? Are you in his word? Do people notice you are? Do people hear that you are? Because if nobody knows and if nobody hears, then you have to say, well, maybe, Jim, I'm not genuinely saved. Maybe I've been playing church and Christianese or, you know, I grew up, you know, uh, in a Methodist church, so I played Methodist. Some of you grew up Catholic, some of you Presbyterian, some of you Baptist. Whatever your denomination that you grew up, you played the role just to appease mom and dad, just to appease the priest or pastor, whatever the case is. But you never, ever, ever surrendered your life to Christ. So when this ends, which is going to end right now as we close in prayer, I'm just going to read out the last couple of verses as it goes out. But... I want to encourage you, if you don't know, if you don't know, if you die going home tonight, you please talk to me. I'll lead you in the sinner's prayer. You ask Jesus to come into your heart, forgive your sins, cleanse you of all your unrighteousness, and experience what I'm talking about. That's why we're here. Because everyone in this room, we all have different backgrounds, we all have different stories. But everyone who's been born again will tell you this. At some point, they encounter Jesus, and he's changed their life forever, right? <laughs> Verse 27, let's just read this to the close. It's just like two more verses. And in those days, there were prophets that came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit there was going to be a great famine throughout the whole world, which happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. He was the ruling Caesar of that day. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they did also and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So it's interesting that this church in Antioch, guess what? These Gentile believers, they helped out the people that at first despised them. They didn't want them. The Gentiles helped out the Jewish Christians. Isn't that interesting? That God saved all these Gentiles and now these Jewish believers got a taste of love and help from people that perhaps they first despised in their heart. God does that. <laughs> there have been people in my life who we didn't get along for whatever reason. I had a beef with them. They had a beef with me. And however the story unfolded, he used that person to help me in a certain situation and break down that wall of bitterness and hatred or whatever the case may be. God will do that. And I'm so thankful he does. 
So let's close in prayer. What we, I also want to do too, because I know we've got snacks. When we're done, I would like to break up into small groups. Or I want just, I'm going to be over here. If you need prayer and want prayer, I please encourage you to come. Emily, you know, because usually we do with the men with the men, the women with the women, in case it's a, you know, a male thing or a female thing. Mm -hmm. We want it to be, you know, respectful of that. But she's going to be over here to pray with the women. I'm going to be over here to pray with the guys. So don't just grab a coffee and run. Stick around. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to come into your situations, come into your life, and help you where you're at, okay? Let's pray. Father, just thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you love us more than we could ever know. That when we're feeling like the filthy fowls and those creepy creatures, Lord, you just continue to love us. You're there with us, and you give us each day the strength that we need to overcome. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for calling us out of darkness and into the marvelous light. And help us, Lord, to be these Christians this day and age, to shine brighter than the, the church has ever shined before. I believe, Lord, the vision you've given for this place is going to come to pass, that we're going to see a lot of people get saved and a lot of lives changed, all for the cause of Christ. All the glory and honor is due to you and to you alone. Thank you for my dear brothers and sisters that are here tonight. And thank you for those that will just someday listen or watch this over the video. Would you just bless them where they're at, encourage them, and strengthen them in their faith. This we ask in the name of Jesus.